What's going on? Maybe I just introduce myself. My name is Anne Metla. I'm executive director of the Lisbon Council, the think tank based in Brussels. Now, a very special thanks to Alexander von Gawain. Uh, I think you really set up the day perfectly, gave us lots to think about. Just to remind you, the, the theme of the day is what makes a kick a kick? So at the end of the day, we better have answered this question, I hope. Uh, and uh, I, we will do so with all of your input. Uh, uh, so we're running a little bit behind. So I took an executive decision. Uh, I exerted management and said I'm going to uh, essentially not give any opening of remarks uh, because so much has already been said. Um, I do, however, want to say that for those of you on Twitter, uh, the hashtag is hash EIT conference. Please be active on Twitter. I will take a look also during the lunch break. If you have questions, uh, want to raise anything, please do so. I will check later. Now, let me immediately turn my attention to our excellent panel this morning, uh, which is to shed light on this uh, crucial issue on how to achieve impact through collaboration and partnerships. I think Alexander made a great point this morning to say it's not so much the lack of ideas or vision of where we want to go, but there is sort of a management challenge of how do we go from this idea and this vision to really make it happen. I think this panel, which is essentially about how to achieve impact through collaboration, through partnerships, has a lot to say in this regard. Now, with that, let me turn my attention to our first speaker this morning, which is uh, uh, Lambert van Nistelrooy. I apologize for the terrible pronunciation. Uh, a distinguished member of the European Parliament who serves on the Committee on Regional Development. Lambert, uh, you are, of course, well known really for your long standing and committed work in the European Parliament towards ensuring. Uh, financial access uh, for regional development and for innovation. Plus, I mentioned it this morning, I can only repeat that. Against this backdrop, uh, we are very eager to hear what you have to say uh, on this. Uh, what's your perspective on how the case uh, can manage and to integrate really this knowledge triangle which we have heard so much uh, today. You can either speak from there or here at the podium as you wish. And the floor is yours. Before you speak, let me say maximum, maximum of seven minutes. I will be ruthless for cutting you off. <laughs> Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Lambert von Nistelrooy. Not a football player, not a football player, but related to him. So anyway, so let me use my, my seven minutes. Uh, from the beginning, I was in the core of the debate of the EIT. I was the member of the parliament who brought the two words, you know, innovation and. And this was the action of the industry committee who took away this, this difficult, in the difficult situation, the reluctance of the member states. You remember, Borosso came and Cavallo worked on it. And the member state said, no, because this is not your competence, Europe. Stay away from this work. And then the parliament, industry committee, committee said, yes, but we have to take it from this education column into the innovation whole chain. And the Biggest thing in my first period as member of the parliament were two words. My amendment, bringing in the title Innovation End. Remember? Look how it is. My second thing is that we have to go on and look in a very good way because the EIT is just a little instrument in financial terms till now and there is a debate about the future. So, in fact, we have to think, where do we stand in 2025? And then you see that the EIT is this wonderful diamond that, that can grow, but should also place itself in a broader environment. And that's why I am being the rapporteur from the Regional Development Committee with the Regional Development Fund that has grown very strong in the financial debates. You know, we had in the beginning of this uh, summit on the future perspectives, we had 200, uh, 309 billion for the regional funds, and we came out to 325. So what did the member states do? They put money, this, the big money, and put it into the regional funds to be spent 
on this agenda smarter, greener, and inclusive, EU 2020. This is reality. And now I'm the main negotiator with the Council on spending this money on these output-oriented things. And we decided, and we got total agreement now with the Council that this is fixed on how to spend this money. This money of the regional fund will be spent on knowledge, knowledge infrastructure, as a first main aim. This is the big game changer. So, in fact, the EIT was the first to went up in this new way, but will be followed by a lot of activities throughout Europe, not just your kicks, but many other places, co-locations, whatever will come up. And we call them now, under a framework of small, smart specialization, we, we call it smart specialization strategy, and every country has to come up for the spending of the regional funds for the next seven years with a smart specialization strategy to be agreed in a partnership agreement at the end of the year. And in this partnership agreement, we want to align the investments of these funds, position of the EIT, position of Horizon, with the national state's priorities. Because otherwise, we don't have these delivering effects that we want. And there we are, I think, looking from my perspective to these kicks. The kicks are, let me say, the forward running examples, followed by some other kicks now, but also aligning with the runner-ups that will knock on your door and we agreed now to call them, as you already do in the climate kick, to call them RECs. Regional innovation clusters, regional innovation schemes, whatever you, you might call it. And they, in fact, will give a much bigger deliverance on this higher educational uh, system in Europe. The minister just talked about seven centers. He was proud. He said, I have seven centers of higher education focused, etc. If I look throughout Europe, not all at excellence level, of course, but to be aligned in the future European goals that we have. So my, my thing is, being a member of the parliament, you will have a substantial growth of money but not maybe that well, as high as the first proposal, but you have to look step by step, and especially the CEOs who will speak later of the, uh, of the actual kicks, they, on their personal uh, criteria that, that on which they will work in the next years, I invite them, as, as a member of the parliament, to go on in the approach that they do, own responsibility, not of the parliament, but take on board those things that come in the environment, especially those from Eastern Europe that are not uh, well presented in the actual kicks, to take on board and we will deliver also this regional money and then together we make a game changer. I'm convinced. Thank you very much. First of all, for a very thought-provoking presentation, but also for keeping your remarks to six minutes. So we have actually set a very high standard for the rest of the day. Now, the way I would like to do this is uh, if anyone has a question or a comment immediately after a presentation, you're very welcome to intervene now. Or we can have a discussion later on. Okay. Uh, now, I have to warn you, because in advance of this meeting, I received, I believe, six <coughs> pages of questions that were somehow by this audience given in advance. Um, very detailed, very good questions. You're not going to walk out of here very quiet today because <laughs> I know for a fact that you do have many questions. So please uh, warm up for a very good discussion after the initial 
uh, interventions. Now, our next speaker is uh, Ian Short, Chief Executive of the Institute for Sustainability, an independent charity and core partner of the Climate Kick. <coughs> the Climate Kick is, uh, as you all know, is of course one of the three kicks that was created in 2010 by the EIT. And uh, I'm sure you'll tell us more about that in a moment, but just to say uh, that you have a very distinguished uh, background, really a long track record in this field. And you, of course, also worked with Boris Johnson, the mayor of London, on the Smart London Board. So uh, as I said, a very, very distinguished background. And I'm sure you have much to say about today's topic for this Thank you, Anne. OK, I'll take my watch off so I can check my seven minutes, because I'd hate to be hectored off the stage. So um, which of these ones do I push? OK. OK, so we're going to bring it down a level a little bit now and give you, uh, I guess, practical feedback on, on what's happening within the kicks in terms of delivering impact through excellent partnerships. Now. Um, the climate kick, I think, is a little different from the other two kicks in terms of how we measure impact is in, in two equal measures. Uh, one which is shared with the other kicks is in terms of European economic growth, but the second one for us is um, purely societal, so it's uh, impact on climate change, both adaptation and mitigation. And while, uh, while we share many of, many of these challenges, actually what we have to do within the climate kick is we have to figure out how we get the right balance between them because uh, many of the people that we have working with us are there um, because they have a passion because they want to save the planet or they have a passion because they want to get things right for their cities or for their communities as well as people who have a passion for um, wanting to see new innovation and, and making money. Um, Many of the things that we support within the climate kick uh, get the balance right and, in fact, sit right in the middle of um, dealing with climate change adaptation mitigation and with the, the um, economic growth. But actually, often we have to focus on things which we think can have uh, enormous impact on the climate change side of things. It may not have huge impact in terms of uh, economic growth, um, often in the short term because the climate change game is a long-term game. And uh, where we're working, if there are markets, the markets are dysfunctional. Uh, they don't work very well if they exist. And in many of the places where we are working, we are starting by looking at how we can support and create markets, which we then can um, drive our innovators and entrepreneurs through to, to um, grow the markets. So we've gone one better um, and added, added a third in terms of our, our innovation triangle and made it an innovation pyramid. We've added the government and um, public bodies because uh, pu the public sector, particularly city, uh, regional and local governments, have a huge role to play in delivering on the climate change agenda, uh, partly through policy but a huge amount through actually in many of the areas that we operate, uh, it's often the public bodies who are leading the innovation agenda. They're the ones who are thinking more systemically about how we deal with um, economic growth, um, uh, health and well-being, climate change, the range of things. How can we do things in an innovative way? Uh, and Lambert mentioned the climate kick is, uh, also has uniquely um, regions um, working with the co-location centres. So we have um, quite, a broad, uh, quite, a, quite a broad spread. And within the regions, many of the regions are led by city or local governments and, and public bodies. So that gives us that added dimension. In terms of our um, makeup of the partners, uh, roughly 50% of the partners uh, are companies or businesses, 30% uh, are academic or research institutions, and 20% are the government public bodies and not-for-profits. Within, within the business side of the 50%, we have roughly 50% big business and 50% uh, SMEs and small business. And we think that it's essential that we get the balance right within our community to make sure that we can um, shape programs and shape, shape activities so that we can have big impact. Okay, so as I said, uh, in terms of the climate change, we're looking both at mitigation and adaptation, and that too provides challenges because um, much of the planet has focused to date on, on the mitigation side of things. 
Uh, but those who are at the forefront of the climate change agenda um, are quickly realizing that we've passed the point of um, huge focus on mitigation. We now need to start balancing the adaptation side as well. Um, what we did 12 months ago uh, as, an, as a group, as a partnership, as a community, we decided actually we needed to evolve the way that we were working so that we could create closer, more tight-knit communities of experts from the different areas with different types of focus. So what we've, what we've done, or we agreed 12 months ago and are still in the evolution of uh, setting up, is so we've set up something we call platforms or challenge platforms. We have eight of these platforms, and what the platforms do is they effectively create, create the place where um, the academics, the researchers, the city governments, the businesses, both small and large, who are active uh, in these areas, and we, we work with people who are best in class, world class in terms of what they do, and so we look for these people to come together in a cluster and say, okay, where can the climate kick have the biggest impact? How can we set up the structures and the, uh, and the tools that will, will enable you to come and work with people from, from different parts of the community and really deliver high impact? I'm not going to touch on... Um, the, the, the platforms, you can see them there. I will pick up on one, though, as a practical example. It's one that I work um, most actively in. It's one um, called uh, Sustainable City Systems. So I should have said, actually, that the, the purple that's just come up there is the, the eighth one. The eighth one is slightly different, whereas the, the first seven, a lot of it is technology-focused. We've realized that much of what is required in terms of innovation for delivering on climate change is socio-technical or, or, or less physical. So it's the financing models, it's the governance models, it's the ways you engage people, the way you look at behavior change, things like that. So we have a platform called uh, Making Transitions Happen. Okay, so city, sustainable city systems, I think, is a great, um, a perfect example for why the climate kick can have enormous value in this area. Major challenges with delivering sustainable, smart cities is around the fragmented governance, the, the lack of integration, the fact that actually the solutions we need need to move us well away from the siloed planning and the siloed investment and the siloed interventions into looking at where city systems come together, looking at where by planning for and investing in an integrated way we can deliver huge efficiencies as well as deliver improvements in terms of quality of life and impact on climate. So what does the sustainable city systems do? We're looking primarily at where the city systems integrate, where the opportunities are there for um, efficiencies, um, I, as I said, both in terms of planning but also in terms of delivery. Even within that, though, I mean, I, I guess if you think about the investments that are going on in cities, the EIT budget, in fact, and the climate kick budget is a tiny fraction of what we could do in, in one tiny area. So what we look to do is we look to partner with the organizations within the cities that we're working in or the urban areas we're working in <coughs> who are already involved in best practice in these areas. And then within that, we say, OK, let's think how we can bring the Climate Kick partnership together, bring all the different elements of our, of our pyramid together to add a layer, to take what is already world-class and best practice and take it um, a step further. OK, and then my last slide um, is a, another practical example of what we're doing around achieving impact through excellent partnerships. This is a program of activity we call Climate Market Accelerator, and it's really recognizing that even with the resources that we have with um, the partners that we have, what we're going to need to do, we're going to need to create um, not just lots of interesting projects and programs, we're going to have to create external platforms that then bring others, bring others forward as well. So what we've done is, um, in the UK, I'll give the UK example, my organisation runs this for the climate kick across Europe. I'm actively involved in the one in the UK, where we've set up three, in fact, I'm about to set up four, Anne mentioned um, Boris Johnson's um, Smart London Board, where we're setting up a fourth, which is really bringing together the large demand side players, the, the, the big spenders of innovation in delivering uh, in this case, a commercial and municipal property in terms of built environment, retailers in the built environment, and large residential um, property owners in the built environment. The fourth one we're setting up, as I said, is for with, uh, the mayor's office looking at sm smart London. So where are the smart city projects that are going into London? Let's bring the players who are investing in and delivering these projects. Let's create them as the demand side, get them, help them articulate where their challenges are, what they need, and then connect them with the entire community of the climate kick on the research side, on the innovators side, 
uh, on, the, on the financiers and also on those who are helping support the new financing models and the governance models uh, as well. To date, phenomenal success. We have um, some, of the, some of the top, we have the largest developers and largest property investors, not just in the UK but across Europe, and many of them are international. Still early stage, but the feedback that we're getting, they're turning up every two months, we have our meetings. We're getting board level membership from these huge organisations coming to the table, actively participating in this is what we need, this is where we're stuck, this is how we could work together. And we then take that and we go and work with the Climate Kit community to come in and feed that and build on what they're doing already. And hopefully, that's my seven minutes. Oh, okay, thank you. So let me immediately ask a very quick follow-up uh, question. Uh, you said that uh, sort of the, the partners are eager to collaborate. Tell me in 30 seconds or less why. Is it commercial? Is it do they see new market opportunities? Can you connect them to a wider sort of innovation network that they would otherwise not have access to? Tell me what's the key, uh, reason they are so eager to partner. Even, even the large organizations who are very active in delivering on sustainability and climate change at the forefront of this, they all have the same questions. They all have the same concerns in terms of we're investing huge amounts of money for the long term. What works? What doesn't work? Where is the market going? And I think by working with the climate kit, you have the independence, which is fantastic, and you have the ability to go and pick out world-leading experts in different areas, not just the academics and research side, but other businesses and small businesses as well. So it's access to a network, yes. a world-class network. World-class, active. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a very important insight. Now, our next speaker is Kathy Tsigan, the chairman of the governing board of the um, Inno Energy Tech and chief science officer at the renowned Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. Now, the Inno Energy Tech is, of course, a leading engine uh, for innovation in the field of sustainable energy. And uh, you yourself have a very distinguished uh, background uh, in academia and are very uh, uniquely suited to speak to us about how to foster these important uh, collaborations and partnerships. The floor is yours. Dear Anne, many thanks. Uh, I don't know whether it is an advantage or a disadvantage to belong to the veterans of the development of KIC. I just remember that uh, I think in 2006 I first stepped into the environment of EIT or the then to be established EIT. And so far I can really, uh, let me say, have a short look on the transition of the very first ideas of EIT and the KICs towards what we have achieved today. And I'm really, I'm really happy that this development, meanwhile, has so many supporters and so many interested people from companies, from business, from academia, from education, and from politics supporting this development. Let me just focus on a few aspects just to deliver what is my personal impression. Um, integration, and that is the topic of our session, integration of the three, pillar, of the three corners starts by drafting the proposal. A precondition of that is the, meant, the mutual understanding of business people and academic people. That is really a precondition. From ancient education, that means finish the school and step into industry, we have to go forward to entrepreneurial mentality. The involvement of the students in innovation projects. For example, in Kik Inno Energy, we have already 83 students working in innovation projects in an early phase. The PhD candidates, we have one, an example, who started from a PhD education towards a business creation and then becomes a partner in innovation project. Uh, Pep Salas, uh, he is an entrepreneur and he will speak to you tomorrow afternoon. So, the best is to work with testimonials, not to say it by yourself that you are the best one. Let others do so. <laughs> Innovation requires venture capital, not research funding. This is one of the big mistakes which is out there in the community quite often. EIT and the KICs are not research funders. 
We do the last mile of the innovation process. We support the valley of death, like Alex has explained. Uh, a market study is compulsory in our case, and we have already 150 partners re, uh, in, involved in projects all over Europe in the Kik Inno Energy. The principle of the European dimension with strong local basis is important. To be honest, the real integration takes place physically, sitting in one room, sharing lunch and coffee breaks, and maybe a glass of Guinness or a glass of wine in the evening hours. Co-location centers are therefore one of the essential pillars. Now coming to the organization. We are organized like a company. We are a shareholder company in Kik Inno Energy, a European company. But we have a special political mission. And the integration effort as such will only proceed if the partners understand and use the benefit of the integration process. How do we monitor it? Yes, we monitor it. We have a scoreboard. We have KPIs. We count the numbers uh, of researchers involved in the innovation project and vice versa. We count the money flowing into the innovation project from external uh, investors, for example. Another le lecture which I, or lesson learned which I would like to transfer here is if you start a new kick, please start it very professional from the very first moment on. We were lucky. We found one of the leading European uh, consultancy companies accompanying our work on the proposal, acting like a moderator between industry needs and academic interest. That is so important that you mentality go around the table sitting on the other side of the, uh, on the other chair and try to look from that point of view on your contribution. That is so important. Professional support and excellence in organization is unavoidable. And please, also in the very first beginning, agree on the objectives of your kick as early as possible and set clear and transparent rules of governance. Let me conclude with one sentence. Our children are the only real renewable resource we have. Really. Uh, last week, we discussed in Brussels in the Parliament the issue of intergenerational fairness. Let's shape, and that is now the point of view of the energy uh, branch, Let's shape European energy landscape more fair and contributing to the wealth of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. A very nice uh, way to close your statement to remind us that there is really uh, a higher cause here. Now, uh, I, uh, I just want to say it's been extremely fascinating to hear from someone who's been with the EIT and the formation of the kicks from the beginning. You called yourself a veteran. I would have done that, but since you called yourself that, I will say. And, uh, you know, the emphasis really on this integration uh, and, and saying you were accompanied by a and management firm, going back again to what Alexander said, really setting you off to this professional start. I know in passing, you said you're a company with shareholders. Who are your shareholders? The shareholders are the partners who establish the proposal of the kick. These include some 30 partners, formal partners, all over the six co-location centers in Europe. These are the big companies in the energy sector. These are the well and prestigious research institutions and the universities. And believe me, the first year of the creation of the kick, we spent a lot more hours negotiating with lawyers and ministries instead of setting up the company. Because it's not so easy to agree on a company which, problem, for example, has to be passed or accepted by the Swedish parliament if the, if the University of Stockholm is, a, is becoming a partner. So, yes, our partners are contributing actively each year by one million, I can say this, one million contribution each year. 
And all the 30 partners, after one year of negotiations, are ready to do so, and we do it since two years, and we have now established a professional organization. A quick follow-up question. What's the return on investment? Have you already, has there been a return on investment, or they just get to pay one billion a year, which is a good deal for you, but not necessarily, if I look at it from the point of view of the shareholder? This is, this is quite clear the point of view of an investor. We, and I have two heads, I am the chairman of the KIK and I am a member of the KIT. And KIT is one of these shareholders. We wouldn't have done this venture if we are not convinced that it will pay off in the long run. Don't think too short. I mean, investors do not expect within two years a return on investment. When do you envision We hope that we, or we hope, we are convinced, we have already the output of some of our innovation projects. So we can guess that we, after a period of three, four years, we will have the first uh, real output. We have one company established, uh, which has right now got the first big order for this company, with a new product developed in an innovation project of the King. I find this fascinating, because it sounds to me like you're also an accelerator, essentially. We can think about it more, but before that, Ian, is, are you set up as a company as well, Climate uh, King? No. What is your legal form? Legal entity is Mary. It's a not-for-profit association. It's a, it's a Dutch association, not-for-profit, but the, we have core partners, and the core partners uh, have legal responsibility for um, the net position of the legal entity, and we have affiliate partners who come in and contribute in other ways. Very good. As a non-profit, you may have sort of less shareholder legal. pressure, so uh, I can't think of uh, you uh, <laughs> 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 We, 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 we press our CEO, for example, here, and our management team, and uh, I, I really have to confess that this professional organization co works quite well, but in a different way than we have expected when we started the first ideas of our kick. Also, right here, we have changed our strategy step by step. Very good. So this is your CEO. He's Seems like a very happy man, so not too much for <laughs> So our last speaker in this session is Magnus uh, Matforce, Director for Research and Development Policy at Ericsson, and a member of the Executive Board of the EIT ICT Labs. Um, the ICT Labs, of course, uh, um, as well bring together education, research, and business with the aim uh, to drive European leadership and ICT innovation. Uh, Magnus, you yourself, you bring with you uh, more than 20 years of experience in this field, so it'll be very interesting to hear from you. I hope you will also mention this issue of what legal form uh, the ICT labs have, because I think this is actually quite important for this theme of collaborating, integration, etc. The floor is yours, Thank you. Association under Belgium law, that was the question, answer on your question. So, but let's start uh, with uh, giving uh, a bit of history then, and also I would like to say that, of course, I represent ICT Labs here, here today, but I would also like to be one of the panelists that, that complements what uh, previous speakers have said, so I will not repeat too much. Instead, I will try to keep myself short and, and go into the question and answer session instead. I'll open up by giving you the perspective and, and say that in 2006, or even a little bit before that, but I told President Barroso, myself in person, that EIT, his proposal, was a bad idea. That was the starting point of my interaction on this. And that was, that was the, at the time when the proposal from the Commission was to create one location, one house in Europe, and everyone should take an, undertake employment in that separate house. We had quite good discussions on that and uh, our proposal from stakeholder groups in together with the discussion with the Commission was to set up a more networked organization and that is what we had today and that, that was what, 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 what we actually has today. And then the Parliament, as Lambert rightly said, added the word innovation into EIT because I thought it was, I think it was European Institute of Technology to start with. Uh, what is, I will take, I will not go into much details, talks about how we are organized and so on, because you have all the brochures out there, you can find that, and there will also be separate sessions on that. I will just take this slightly different and complementing approach and say, why are we engaging into the EIT? And as a stakeholder representing Ericsson today, as an industry partner, why 
do we actually go into this endeavor altogether with the partners? And, and I'd say one of the key <coughs> things for us is to, to secure the future availability of competence. We, as, as a stakeholder, we have the possibility to influence our academia organizations, to bring them closer to our markets, to bring them closer to our visions, technology strategies, future business interests, to see that, that we can actually interrogate with the academia and see to it that European industry has the future competence that it needs. Also, we would like to create an environment which is very dynamic and that attracts the top talents that we want to have in our ecosystem. Because we think that the top talents are the ones that will bring us the ideas for our future business in Europe and also elsewhere. EIT, the networking organization as we have it today, is also one excellent way of bringing closer to cooperation together between the industry partners being large enterprises, small and, small and medium enterprises, uh, and universities, and also not to forget the research institutes. And to do research in cross-disciplinary areas where we can also attract financing to the different things. We also need to remember that EIT is about education, research, and innovation. And what we have put a lot of effort into EIT Acid Labs is to span a number of different, we can call them thematic areas or, or well, let's, let's call them thematic areas in order not to get into much details. And then we can say that in those areas, some areas, we have a lot of knowledge in, in Europe. We have a lot of competence and knowledge but we have not seen so much of products on the market. In those areas, we should, in the IT, IT the labs, focus on the, on the innovation part, to try to bring those results, investments that we have done in the past, in framework programs and so on, in standardization, into products on the market. In other areas, we see a need when we discuss with, for instance, societies, cities, and, and, the, and the users of technology, for solutions that we have not really yet the technology and knowledge for. In those areas, we should focus more on, on setting up new educational programs to foster the competence build-up. We, we should undertake and run research programs that in the longer run should also hand over to innovation programs. EIT, ICD labs, and, and the kick here is one very good instrument to overarch these processes, you can say, where we actually can see that the educational programs delivers what is needed by the industry and we do the research programs in areas where we see that we have competence or knowledge gaps and we do the innovation programs where we see that the market is mature enough. We can in the Q&A session go into more details and on an exam to do examples on that. What I, what I see and what we see and we discussed a lot in not only as, as me being representative on the industry, but also being also representative of ICT Labs here today, is that a few guiding principles we have for the ICT Labs, and that is simplicity, flexibility, and transparency. Simplicity is that we need to have, we want to have something that is considerably simpler and faster compared to what we have today. Because we have a lot of instruments today in Europe. We have the European Research Framework programs. We have educational programs. We have the innovation programs. But if we now set up an EIT and the KICS, our guiding principles was to have something that is simpler and, and faster compared to traditional programs. <coughs> Flexibility, and that is a point which is very keen to us and close to our heart. <coughs> we need to be able to have ease of change of our activities. EIT is about education, research, and innovation. Research, education, we can plan. We can make the so-called master plan for, for many years. We can undertake the build-up of that. Innovation is not something you plan two, three years ahead. Innovation is something that takes place or happens in the backseat of a taxi, at a coffee shop, during the lunch break today, we come up with a brilliant idea when we talk together here. And we decide to leave our profession and we start up a new company and we take it off. We don't have that in a business plan for the next two, three years. And that I'm said, EIT and the KICS need to be able to handle the flexibility. 
transparency, and that comes with simplicity and flexibility perhaps, because with transparency we mean clear, simple, and stable rules. We need to have that in Europe in order to create <coughs> an environment where we can trust each other and that we can act and we can move fast. I'll stop there. Now, uh, I was particularly interested in what you said, Marcus, because you are um, uh, a voice for industry, and uh, you mentioned that uh, you, you sort of, you are part of this because you want to have access to this top talent. Um, and this is, of course, shared by all companies in the ICT field. It's really a shortage, no, of talent. Have you found it? <coughs> Yes, I think uh, my question is uh, both yes and no because what we are, we should not forget that uh, sometimes, sometimes we tend to forget that things take time. We, we launched the EIT a couple of years ago, the Kid Cancer recently, a couple of two years ago, started up. And within the EIT labs, uh, we have just recently started up our master schools and doctoral schools and started to actually produce the huge top talents in Europe. And that, you know, takes a little bit of time. But we can we can separate the questions into academic uh, knowledge and also partner knowledge. And I say that uh, for our network in ICD labs, we as a partner, we have as an industry partner representing Ericsson, we have found uh, good partners in our network and we have found good corporations which we would not have found elsewhere outside the network. So from that perspective, it serves its purpose. But you still need to remember it's still in the growing phase and we have established quite a few things mm. to Thank you. I think that this is really something that I take away from the session and that all of you mentioned is people and organizations engage because you can give them access to networks that they otherwise wouldn't have. Um, before I go to the floor, Lambert, uh, you are sort of the odd person out in this uh, panel, if I may say, because you're a politician, you come from Parliament, uh, you represent a representative region, you know, region. Um, just uh, 30 seconds on what do you make out of all of this, and how can the Parliament really um, bring, uh, you know, talk about flexibility, uh, transparency, we all know that sort of uh, the commission programs are not exactly a beacon of uh, transparency, flexibility, etc. What can be done in the next framework period to really facilitate this and make it all much easier? 30 seconds. I think you always <coughs> go where really the movement is, and the movement is with young people. The movement is with, for instance, the ICT driven society and what Europe does, if you compare it with, with, with South Korea, etc. We should, in fact, enable them. There's an important thing. There to concentrate, and this is now in the Lisbon Treaty, that concentration is accepted if you connect and if you cooperate. So Europe can be flat, everyone the same, giving each an envelope, this is finished, and we lose the game. So this is the change that, that comes up in two years' time from these uh, cooperations. It's so precious, but we just started at the beginning. And it's not just that sentence, not just the top excellence, because this is already not easy to serve. But this is the, the broad reservoir in between in this higher education to remind that <coughs> there are now new instruments upcoming that we should explore in another way than we did in the last hundred years ago. Very good. And uh, by the way, what you just mentioned, namely that governments want to see more return on investment, will be good news to the EIT, because a lot of money has gone into regional funds. <coughs> into countries that are now, you know, um, receiving bailouts. So a lot of money is spent, not necessarily, you know, with the highest return. With that, we go to, uh, to the floor. Uh, please introduce yourself and ask a very crisp and precise question. Okay, the gentleman over here. Do we have anyone? Uh, please wait for the microphone. It's coming. Mm -hmm. My name is Hans Kampus, and I'm from Wagen, the University of Research Center in the Netherlands. And my question is for you, Mr. Siga. Um, your uh, partners, your uh, uh, stakeholders, they uh, contribute 1 billion euros per year. Um, 
obviously that focuses on very large organizations with, with deep pockets. How do you ensure uh, the participation of small and medium-sized organizations in your kick and uh, that they can participate in a, in a meaningful way and that your program is not directed solely to the interest of these large companies? Thank you. Before you answer, can we collect a few? By the way, I had exactly the same thought. I was like, if that's the threshold, you know, that's pretty high. Anyone else? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, a gentleman over there. A very brave man. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, Dali Vashtis, uh, Minister of Education, Czech Republic. Uh, there was, I have a question to actually to Lambert van Listenoy. There is always a lot of discussion and, and sort of initiatives to uh, combine the Horizon and other research funds together with the cohesion funds. But we are still seeking for the uh, transparent and the clear rules how to use it, how to use it, because it's a kind of combination of funds which are meant for general development and the funds meant for excellent development. And it seems to, to our administrators of the uh, cohesion funds that they will allocate the clear rules how to do it and they are afraid to do it, actually. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you. By the way, I would propose for the next uh, session uh, for the next uh, framework program and regional funds, uh, the motto of uh, the ICT labs, simplicity, transparency, flexibility. Um, anyone else? <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. Yeah, the gentleman over here. Uh, Brian O'Dowd for University College Cork. I have a question um, around the potential tensions between pushing in either of the three directions, uh, education, business, and research institutes, and maybe this one should be directed at Ian, because he mentioned the fourth, but how do the cakes deal with tensions that may arise, because different parties might have a different draw towards one another of those points in the triangle. Okay, very good. Uh, so perhaps we start with the first one, which was uh, for you. Yeah. The question was on the SME participation and the uh, 1 million per year contribution. I should make it quite clear, this 1 million per year is a duty only for the formal 30 shareholders of our company. This is the so-called inner circle. Uh, these are the shareholders. Any partner can participate in our innovation projects. And meanwhile, we have a quite higher number of small and medium-sized companies involved in our projects than the big ones. And I should mention two, uh, let me say, two sentences briefly. I asked our big shareholders, the big energy utilities, for example, why are you participating? And I did the same question to our SMEs also during the business meeting. Why are you participating? It's quite clear, the perspective is quite different. The small company owner told me, a small black forest company delivering measurement technology, he said, I never would have the opportunity to speak to the vice president of Vattenfall personally and to explain my products, and that is my big uh, advantage. And the big guys in our, in our team, they told me quite often, we, what, we are here for two motivations. One is we check, we screen new technologies and innovation quite clearly. The other one, we want to have as early as possible the access to the human power of the future. This is our big motivation. And you have to make quite clear there is a benefit on both sides of the table. And it is acceptable that we have different motivations. And it is, again, my answer is yes, it is open to everybody, to small and medium sized companies, to small universities, big universities, and so on. I think that's excellent. And of course, I mean, these SMEs, many of them uh, are entrepreneurial. They want, you know, they want to grow their market share, they want to have access to the big guns, and that's probably legitimate. You can facilitate that. Now, the second question from the gentleman from the Czech Republic member went to you. Now, you're going to tell us how to make it all much more simple and help uh, our Czech colleagues. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
the game changer, as said before. If we don't change our methods, we will go on like we did. Because in Czech Republic and Poland, they know how to build roads. Every kilometer is a lot of spending, and if you have spent your money well, you are on. This is the way it works. You can go on like that. There is so much power in even your well-educated young people. Really, a lot of it is good technological background. Really, we can use it much better. Our companies fly from the Netherlands to Singapore to start there. And they fly over Eastern Europe. You know? This is the big thing. Politically, the states, <laughs> politically, uh, the, the, these countries have formulated their reach the stairway to excellence. This is something that is in the decision of the, uh, the, the, the multi-annual financial framework. So what we have to do is to align those potential initiatives in these countries together, not just looking down to spend the money, because this was the main thing. No, to align it and to bring it in, in these type of programs that are uh, now evoking under what we call smart specialization. This is absolutely new, this is a game change. Second is multi -fund. Yes, what we did is making pillars throughout Europe. And what the Parliament did, and I have it here in my hands, we as negotiators, from the regional funds, formulated, we are co-legislators, on our own account, the text how to combine the funds. And here you find that the regional funds can be spent to prepare kicks, to prepare rates, to make uh, era chairs, to make the whole list of points out of that money. So the old pillars are gone. And especially for the regional funds, because I hope usually I hear the structural funds. Oh, you have the structural funds, and that's, that's the cohesion fund that is still for roads and environment changes. You know, big things, but the regional development fund, 160 billion, is to be spent in this way. And it is, this is now at stake. And for me, it might be very, very good that within the competence of the EIT, you take up some of these new initiatives. You cannot do all of it, because you have the EIT kicks, and around that, there will be a lot of other initiatives under the uh, smart specialization. And I, when I talked about 2022, there will be a kind of coming together. And I don't know where the EIT is at that moment. Maybe they, they, they have such a good method of working that they are, that you say, hosting these uh, other initiatives that are not now in the field of the EIT. But I don't know, because we have to change. We don't have the time to spend the money to give the envelopes and say, good luck with your envelope. This is, this is the old world. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. It's also my understanding from smart specialization that it really will reduce that funding much more bottom up, uh, you know, much more entrepreneurial. And of course, the parliament is a key, um, key collaborator in this. Now, the third question from our friend from the University of Cork went to you, Ian, but I want Magnus to reflect on that as well. You know, how do you bring it all together? So how do you break down the silos? If I may, can I just have one very quick response to the second question? Yeah. I mean, I, I mentioned uh, in my slightly too long presentation <laughs> that um, we start by looking where people are investing already. So it's essential if we're going to have huge impact that we look where the money is already going. And then you add the excellence money, the innovation money, over the top of it and use that to drive um, huge impact. Now that works in Europe and with the clients we're working with, but we're already seeing people from China and from Middle East and other places coming to the and kick and saying, actually, we're spending a huge amount of money, we're struggling with this stuff, and that, that gives us a prime opportunity. So I, mean, I think there's a huge opportunity to go with the, the um, structural funds, or whatever the funds may be, where money is going in, that's where you want to start and say, let's bring excellence in that time. Okay, very quickly in terms of dealing with tensions. There are, there are tensions, I think probably the biggest, uh, Biggest area for tension within the climate kick has been or is at the moment is, a, is between the different um, uh, elements, partners in the innovation community, is how we're structured and how we work. I think Magnus mentioned um, and stressed it quite well that actually 
these organizations, the individual organizations, we're trying to figure out how we work, how it has all these impacts. So we will have people from business and from academia, small and large business from, from governments coming and saying, actually, I think you need to do it different. The reality is there is no model. We're not taking something off the shelf and saying this is what you have to do. We're, I'm going to say making it up. That makes it sound too primitive. We're not making it up. What we do is we're taking the best brains between us to figure out how we make it work. Very good. Thank you so much, um, Michael. Just very quickly. Yeah, very quickly. I mean, of course, there are tensions uh, in the cake. Um, <coughs> and I think tension is good because tension is a bit of a competition. But what we need to learn and need to understand is that the cakes are built on academia, universities, institutes, and industry, and the industry being large and large institutes and also SMEs. And all these, they have very different interests. They have different capabilities. And they have also different agendas. What the kick is about is to create what we have not had before, and that is an ecosystem where it's okay to give and take. If we create that, we can have the stakeholders to be active in the activities that suits them and fits into the overall plan of the kick. That means that when the result comes out from a research project, it may not fit into that partner's future uh, product strategy or innovation going to market strategy. But instead we can then use the kick as, as a table where we place the result and some other partners in the kick can actually take up from there. That we have not had before. <coughs> that is a little bit taking the attention away because we need to create the atmosphere and, and the ecosystem where, as I said, it's okay to give and take. And in the long run, we will win. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now we'll need to wrap up in a moment, but I want to come back to the panel because Alexander mentioned that there are six new kicks in the making. And I know many of you here in the room, and I think many of you are really shy, so I will ask this question on your behalf, which is if you could give one piece of advice to the new kicks that are now formed. You have a couple of years, you know, of experience with this. One piece of advice in 30 seconds. What would it be? You start with you, Don't start with the illusion that this is another kind of research support. That's my first topic. Second topic is start in the very first beginning to avoid the tensions with all partners or principal partners on the table. If the industry, if business is not involved in creating the kick proposal, you will be wrong. And third, please use immediately a professional support for establishing the key. Very good, thank you. Very precise. Ian. Thank you very much. I would start with clearly identifying where the opportunity is in the area you're looking at. Where, what is it you're looking to focus on? And then think about who are the partners, what are the sectors, what are the backgrounds, who do we need at the table to help us shape something we'll be able to make the most of those opportunities. Excellent, thank you. Magnus. Yeah, uh, the kick uh, when you're setting up uh, the area for you is given. I mean, the, the, those who know. So what I, I would say the most important thing is the three things I would bring to them and say is that define your agenda. That's that's the key. You need to understand what are the things that you're going to do. Second thing is understand it will take some time. But the third and most important is steal with pride. I mean, we are three here. We have done the journey and we have done some good things. We have done some bad things and we can say. Very good. Just stay in my role and not doing the responsibilities of the kids the themselves. What we want more about what you would say really now is that we allow um, regions from and, and regions and, and countries um, to spend 15% of their regional defense money outside their region. 15%. Those who want to get ahead with their universities and with their clusters. They get the possibility to, al to align with their firms, bringing their money, regional firm money, into such a consortium. <coughs> so if they want, they have to deliver both, also financially and to Europe, by the to give them, for the first time, their possibilities. Very good, excellent. Now I'm, of course, uh, well aware that I am uh, what's standing uh, in the way between you and lunch. Uh, but do allow me, uh, perhaps, uh, to share with you some of what I took away from this session. Now, Magnus mentioned tension is good. What he's trying to say in a very euphemistic manner, this is not easy. And there will be tension, because every time you bring together such diverse group of stakeholders, 
it's not going to be that easy. So number one. Secondly, um, Alexander mentioned this and uh, Kyle said as well. This is a management challenge. You know, this is something that is in the private sector, for instance, completely understood. You can get help for overcoming these challenges. So think about the management challenge. And the third thing I take away is that the different groups that engage <coughs> really have different objectives. You mentioned some of them want uh, access to a world-class network, but uh, Karl Friedrich spoke about the SMEs, you know, they want to sell their products, maybe. That's completely okay, you know. And I think that this commercial <laughs> objective, hitherto has oftentimes been sort of poo-pooed, you know, like, ooh, they're trying to sell something. Well, hello, of course they are. I don't want to be with the entrepreneurs, and this is okay. And I think this is important to understand. So these were, for me, some of the you know, things that I took away from this session. Uh, now, before I make some log logistical announcements, I want to thank our speakers. I think you, you really got us off to a very good side.